Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. Online resources to help you train your retriever. Welcome to the Build From Here podcast. On this episode, we have CGA member Colin Pope. Super excited. He is the first one in our studio here. They were all set up, so it's a big moment. We're excited to have you on and uh, and celebrate you. How are you doing? Doing great. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. Yeah. It's, uh, man... You've been with us for a little little while now, so we'll we won't jump straight into to the dog story. I want to get a little background because I always love for the people that are listening to the episode to get to know you a little bit, just to know some context. So, because obviously, if you're a Gun Dog Academy member, you love some hunting. So, what's yeah. uh, what's your story there? How did you how did you fall in love with with the great outdoors? Well, um, so I grew up in in uh, you know South Central Louisiana, and uh, had a family friend that would. Uh, uh, got included in some duck hunts on coastal Louisiana back in the seventies and early eighties and, and was just hooked on that. Uh, you know, that was always, you know, still the, my, the fav- my favorite hunting that I've ever done They always had great dogs, lots of ducks. Um, you know, now I'm, you know, uh, I've, I've live in Mississippi now I have for some time and I've got, uh, you know, property that I hunt in, in the South Mississippi Delta and, we have great deer hunting. We have, you know, all all kinds of game. That's Everything's awesome. very, you know, and, and and have been trying to establish duck hunting, you know, for my sons the way I had it growing up. And it's been challenging, but it's coming along. Um, we had a my youngest son was has been asking for a dog since he could talk, and we finally <laughs> decided to get him uh, a puppy. Uh, one of the puppies that's connected to, to Barton, yeah. went through Barton and and got got him a dog for his 14th birthday. That's awesome. And started, so this is, the dog's name is Bo. We are, you know, he's not quite three now and we've been, have been just going through it. That's and, awesome. Uh, you know, we're, you know, the duck hunting's coming along. Bo is, I, you know, didn't hunt him his first year, kind of, you know, left him at home for that. Uh, got him, you know, and, you know, 52 week plus didn't happen in 52 weeks for me. It has, yeah. it's kind of happens in chunks each year. I, you know, hunting season in particular, the training for me. And I, you know, I say the only, only thing wrong with my dog is, is, is handler related for sure. <laughs> but, um, Bo hunted this past year, picked up a lot of ducks. Um, and it's, you know, we're, you know, I'm in week 45 now. That's I got, awesome. got back with it this spring and it's all about handling now. And he, he does, you know, he, he did, his steadiness and his drive to retrieve is, is couldn't be better. He, you know, we're working on handling now and that's, I think yeah. once we get that handling polished up, I think he's going to be where, where we all think he can be. So that's good. So you said you hunted in the seventies and eighties, I guess yeah. that's when, when we're in, we're in the lead, right? Shooting some Definitely. lead. <laughs> Shooting some six shot lead and it worked really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember, so. I imagine so. So uh, Louisiana, that's uh, I've always heard that's a good good hunting there. I've only done uh, a little bit of hunting there. It was you know in those days it was just you know every the Mississippi Flyway it all migrated. You know, you, you seemed like in those days there was a at least the way I remember it there was a, a more consistent push of ducks that just migrated right there. Yeah. So we had you know it seemed like you had new ducks all the time. The way I remember that camp running is that they had these massive spreads of decoys. They did not ever pick a decoy up. They were always out there, and ducks came came in because it was always new ducks. Yeah, um, I'm finding you know things we work a little harder these days. Oh than yeah, that. but when I was a kid, and I, you know I, I may have be, looked at all that through a different lens than that's, I do now. Well, that's possible too. So, what? Who was the first person that took you on a hunt? Like, were you hunting from a, a child or? Yeah, I, I probably started going when I was about nine or ten, okay. something like that. And my father would take me with his buddy. And um, do you remember your first experience in the in the duck blind? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I remember uh, hunting in an the, my first duck hunt was over near Lake Charles. Okay, and I think uh, my dad took me down there, and we got with a guide and sat in a blind and saw almost nothing. <laughs> and um, I Almost think, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think we had one, what what they call in that area, they call a gray duck, it's a gadwall. Yeah. Flew by, I had a single shot H&R 20 gauge with that lead six shot in there and never shot at a duck before and, and and you know, dropped the duck. Really? It was a cripple. 
That's awesome. I, to, I think the guy had to go out and get it. I don't know. I don't think we collected it, but yeah. that was the very first hunt. Saw one duck, one shot. That was it. But I was wow. still still interested. And then some much better hunts happened later. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, but um, that's that's good for your first duck to to hit. I mean, I, hit. I don't think I hit my first duck for some time in into hunting. There, I was. I was shooting a lot. I wasn't hitting a lot. <laughs> right, right. It's uh, you see it now. You know, some kids are. You know, if you take a kid and they have a bad experience, some some kids will say, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. And some kids are just all about it anyway. And I think that was one of those kids. Yeah. I just liked everything about it, whether there was hard action not or not. You know. Yeah, it's hard not to. It's so yeah. fun to be out in the blind. For what sure. um? For sure. What was your first experience with a retriever in the field? Okay, so I, as I started to continue to get to, you know, usually at, over Christmas time, I'd get invited down to. Uh, this was in Pecan Island. I would okay. get, I'd get to go down and hunt at, at a nice camp down there. And, and uh, my host, the, our family friend, had a beautiful golden retriever that was really well trained and did a, you know, steady. I was amazed by it. Wow. You know, the dog just did. It seemed it seemed to me at the time that the dog knew what everybody was thinking and just did what was required right and maybe he did you know maybe that's the way it was but um i I was you know that that was definitely um all that stuff happening around that you know 10 11 12 13 years old that really uh you know shapes you shapes you how you think about what what you want to what you want to pursue and that, that was definitely important yeah so that kind of you were pretty much hooked so that was whatever you were going to be doing was going to be involved with hunting of some sort, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So where did you go from there? So that was your first experience. You know, obviously you growing, going up through high school and all that. What was kind of your hunting like at that point? Were you getting out a lot by yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, you know, it was small game for me okay. when I was when I was not doing that. It was, um, you know, we were, uh, we did a lot of squirrel hunting. Yeah. Um, and, and not with a dog. We, you know, we, we have a, we have a squirrel dog now that we run sometimes, but you know, it was all, you know, you and your friends would go out and pocket full of shells and go, go hunt squirrels. Some rabbits would be involved. You might get a dove hunt or two at the beginning of the you know, beginning of the year. Um, deer hunting wasn't as big as in, in the eighties. We weren't, we didn't hunt, hunt as hunt deer as much. We yeah. t- turkey hunt in the spring. But I think that that, um, Doing all that squirrel hunting, I think that really is a great way for young people to learn woodsmanship because you really, you get out there and you're moving through areas of, of the woods that you wouldn't ordinarily. Yeah. Um, That's pretty cool. And I think that it, it, you know, if you want to, I had a guy that tell me one time that was involved, involved in those, those years with me. So if you want to know where deer are betting, ask the squirrel hunter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because they're they're out there in those weird areas where nobody ever walks. Yeah, and if, you're, if you just deer hunt, you're slipping in and slipping out. But if you've done some, you know, if you're out there busting the brush doing that other sport, then you you uh, you really know the woods. I think yeah. it's a great way for for young people to get started. Is, oh, is that's that great small game hunting. So it sounds like kind of what I'm hearing you. A couple of things that I've heard you said that you know you you kind of were hunting in the '70s and '80s for waterfowl loving the deer hunting you, you sound like you kind of have a, a little heart a bit of a heart for conservation it mm-hmm. seems to what sure let's talk about that for a minute because hunting 70s 80s versus now where you're having to work harder for it what's you know is that the, pretty you important know, to you to, to support conservation oh, i think so you know? for sure i mean i think um you know there were times back then when ducks were scarcer too. I remember the point system that, that people talk about. I remember hunting when every duck you killed had a had a point value assigned to it. Wow. And you know, if you shot a you know, if you killed a redhead or a canvasback, you were done for the day. And you yeah. might I don't remember everything about it, but it was they were, they were really limiting what you could shoot back then, how much how many birds you could kill. So that had happened back then too. Yeah. Um I think um from a conservation standpoint where, you know, I've got, you know, land that's in WRE, which is, you know, wetland reclamation programs, yeah. you know, taking marginal farmland and converting it back into wetlands that support ducks. Yeah. Uh, I've got a, a bunch of land in that that I'm working all the time to 
you know, be in compliance with, and that's what that's all about. Creating, wow. you know, where there used to be soybean fields. Now we've got, you know, invertebrates that gadwalls can feed on. And, wow. Uh, you know, moist soil grasses are being cultivated out in all this acreage. I think it's a great program. That's that, awesome. That we participate in. So oh, that's great. I think that's um, especially for the future generations. So you've got mm -hmm. your son. I remember when uh, first member weekend came out, yeah. you, you brought your son, you had Bo there. And uh, so obviously for the next generation, it's important to keep, keep that heritage going. For sure. For sure. They're, you know, I've, I've you know, put those boys in a lot of, in, in, you know, done the best I could to put them in, in situations the, that I thought I was in when I was younger. And, um, yeah, they're both i've got two sons they're both both really into it and you know, yeah good good woodsman that's awesome for sure squirrel older boy's a big squirrel hunter that's his yeah. favorite so well nothing wrong with that it's a good way to learn yeah i mean that's so. fun it's nice to just get out and walk and i love a good just in the fall especially just mm -hmm. as you're going out through it's, the woods you know, you, it's hard to teach a kid how to move in the woods quietly <laughs> you know, and, and not you know it's but they it's kind of it, it's a little bit like the dog training it's like you know those first few years you're like you have to pick your feet up. Yeah. You got to pick your feet up. And then Don't step on the do. sticks, you know, avoid all that. And After a while they do. Yeah. So I'm not quite there yet. My, my little girl's still young and we've got another one on yeah. the way. So we'll, yeah, we'll see, uh, see as we get, that's a good place to be in. You got yeah. it all to look forward to. Oh, I know. I'm excited. So, it's already going by so fast. It's oh just crazy. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I, you know, I've first got the place that I'm talking about, they were like, eight and nine years okay, old so yeah. they're now you know sophomore junior in high school wow both bigger than i am so <laughs> it's about five minutes ago yeah wow so. that is crazy that is crazy mm. so well so big in into all outdoors it sounds like how did yeah. uh how did you make that decision and it sounded like maybe your son uh was one of the reasons you made a decision to get a, a dog is that something y'all had been dreaming about before or was it just something that it was more he wanted or like he, you had been thinking about he it? He wanted a dog. And I thought, yeah, I think he needs to have a dog. He really does. He's he's kept this up for a long time. I think he's serious about it. And <laughs> if we're going to have one, I want it to be a dog that can work. Yeah. And um, and um, so, you know, took that very seriously. Um, I want our job, our dogs to be, a, you know, do a job. And, you know, my passion is, is hunting and, 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 you know, and duck hunting in particular. So I just, there was no choice yeah. for me. It was going to yeah. be, it was gonna be a lab. I reached out to a friend of mine that, uh, has a fantastic dog that I think they got from Keith, yeah. uh, years ago and, and just got hooked in, you know, just met him and he was gracious to me and just got involved with the whole program wow. from there. So that's awesome. So puppy pickup, where, when did you find out about Cornerstone? Did, did you already have your dog? Did you, were, were you researching how to train a dog? Were you even um, thinking about training the dog yourself? You know, um, I think when I started talking to Keith about it, that seed was being planted, that this is a possibility. Yeah. And um, it was very much like, you know, it was, it just happened very naturally. I, I, I told him, you know, I, I think I'd like to do it myself, but I need, I need to be spoon fed how to do this. And he said, well, <laughs> funny you say that. Cause you know, we've got, we've got something I think you might, might should look at. And I yeah. did. And I was like, that's, that's exactly what I need to do. I don't that's need, awesome. I need as much, I need to be shown exactly what to do. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, in order to get, cause it's, it's a lot of elbow grease. You can't take the elbow grease out of it, but uh, you know, it, it helps me to know that every day I go out with that dog, you know, I, I know what I'm about to do. Yeah. Whereas I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to achieve that without, without that guidance. So. That's awesome. So when, when, when you talked to him about that, I guess, did you think about it for a bit? Or are you kind of like, Hey, let's go ahead and pull the trigger and dive in. And it was obvious. It yeah. Yeah. I needed it. It was, it was obvious what to do. Um, awesome. What was your first experience like diving into the course when you opened it up and just started giving it a try. You know, I remember, uh, getting him out and, you know, you know, I realized I needed to get certain things together. And what I remember most is going and buying the materials to build a place board. Yeah. I'd never thought the first time I ever heard the word place board. And the first thing you do that I remember, you know, kind of working on is you get your, 
you know, you get your puppy to put its feet up on the place board and get on there. And, um, you know, it, it all went very, very smoothly. You know, he seemed to want to do, you know, he was just a kind of a little machine when he was seven weeks old. That's awesome. Um, and, uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the training. Just the first, I mean, the initial start, you know, when my wife, she filmed 52 plus. So when we, (laughs) she didn't know what she was getting into. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I don't think, yeah, yeah, we're going to film this dog training. You know, it's a lot. She didn't quite realize how long that was going to take. This is going to be your life. (laughs) It was. And I don't think she realized that. I told her, I was like, yeah, it's, it's more than you think. It's, there's a lot to it. But you know, the first click, the first treat on, on the board. I mean, I remember us filming that and I remember, I like, I remember it was like it was yesterday now, but just like thinking, yeah, at least we got the first thing done. First step in the right direction. We got, we got a long road ahead, but it's always good to see that that first part just very encouraging to have that first, those first few lessons that are doable and the the dog can, you know, naturally do. Yeah. It was great. It's great. That's awesome. So Off and you, running. You go through, that was a big moment for you. Mm-hmm. And did your son, was he involved with this part of the training too? As or? much as he can be. You know, he's, yeah. you know, they're, you know, as, as students, you know, he's in school all yeah. the time and doing his thing, but he, he wants to come out and train whenever we can. He's come to two training weekends, as, as you know, and yeah. had a great time. Um, would like, would have loved to have come up here this time. He'll, he'll, he'll be back. He'll be Good. back. But, um, I, you know, a lot of the training that, you know, to get in there and really get cons- to do the consistent training has really happens when he's in school. They get out the door and I'll shape my day so that I, this is what works for me. They get out the door and I go straight and do, do that while well, it's yeah. cool in the morning. And, um, and so I'll, I'll go through it with him, keep him up to date, show him what we've done. So that way when we're in the field, he can handle the dog. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, unfortunately, he has to go sit in math class and chemistry and <laughs> that's that kind so of stuff. Tough. It is thinking tough. about. Uh, no, I bet that's eating him. He up. would he would stop school in a heartbeat if we <laughs> said it was okay and just uh, you know figure that stuff out on his own. But you know, he's but like I say, I keep you know I I try to keep him abreast of what's happening so that he can't handle the dog that's good. along with me. Um, so it's yeah. awesome. This episode of the Build From Here podcast is brought to you by Retriever Training Supply, gear your retriever will love. If you're in the market for some new training dummies, maybe you need a Kato board, a launcher, or really anything else you need for your retriever training journey, you can find it at retrievertrainingsupply.com. Go ahead, visit retrievertrainingsupply.com, find the gear your retriever will love. So kind of picking back up, what what point of the, the training journey you're early on. What what was your, where was your mindset like around week three to ten somewhere in there when you had some success? This is your first your first dog. Things have gone pretty well thus far. Maybe running a couple of bumps, but overall pretty good. What what was your mindset at this point? Like what were you thinking about like the rest of the training and everything? I was you know I was I was looking forward to the you know the to get into the hunting part. You know always <laughs> that's that's what. You know, I always would want to. Yeah, I knew that was coming, and I would peek ahead and see what you know what was coming up. But you just have to. You know, I would. I would. I'm very uh, locked into just grinding. You know, kind of just going in order yeah. and following the program. Um, and uh, the you know, the first ten weeks I think went very smoothly. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I don't recall having too much trouble at that time. It was, you know, moving through, you know, uh, what, what's happening at that time. It's, um, obedience. Yeah. Mostly. Ob- obedience. Yeah. You're combining. It's more, yeah. you're transitioning really from basic obedience to mm-hmm. intermediate obedience. Right. And really the next phase from there is advanced obedience where mm-hmm. you're transitioning into the field work. Right. So. And trying to get him to, uh, you know, be a, a socially acceptable dog yeah. up front and into mind and, to, yeah. and to, you know, do our thing. We you know we had these, that first members only weekend I came to and everybody's dog was, you know, I remember he said, hey, you know, hands up everybody's dog that's under a year old and everybody's hand went up. <laughs> so we all got our dogs. We all, you know, puppy pickup happened in COVID. And so, you know, these dogs were socialized a little differently than you yeah. m- might ordinarily it's not a problem long-term. He just, yeah. he's, you know, he 
they have their might bark a little bit at a stranger for a minute, but that yeah. it doesn't last. But yeah, the first ten weeks were good, and I thought, you know, I'm clearly a genius, and this is perfect, and everything's <laughs> going to be fine. And you know, at week ten, I've got. 42 weeks left and we're finished. Yeah. And, and you're, thinking, you're, you're like, well, we're getting real close. Thought, Let me look at, at the calendar. Point. What day will I be done with this? Cause yeah. it's, you know, yeah. That's unfortunately what was, it doesn't, that's what I was thinking. Typically go that way. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's why we, we always say we help people know where to start, what to do next and then how to solve problems. And there's right. a reason we put that how to solve problems in there for sure. Yeah, Cause I mean, they come up. Yeah. Um, and our goal is, not just for someone to follow the program, which it is. I mean, you should follow it reasonably close, mm-hmm. but the goal is is for people to learn as they go through it and I learn how to think like a trainer. Not just learn, get your dog to do stuff, but learn how your dog works, why it functions that way, and then how can you take that knowledge and be prepared to solve problems when they arise. You know, I mean, it's yeah. just it's going to happen. What was kind of your first? Um, Roadblock, you know, typically people will hit two or three what I consider major roadblocks Mm -hmm. when they're training their dogs. And when I say major roadblock, that's a point where they're pulling their hair out thinking that their dog, they they might need to go get another dog. Yeah. I I mean, I don't think I I never felt that way, but I did come to places a couple of two or three times (laughs) where I thought just really just out of my comfort zone is where I would put it, where I, I think. I don't know how to solve this. I'm yeah. not sure what to do here. Um, a lot of times I could push through, just keep trying, look ahead a little bit in the in the program and see where we're headed. So I have to, you know, I can get tunnel vision on this week and this lesson and just sit there and grind on this lesson. Well, sometimes yeah. it helps to get a little bit of, go get some feedback from some other members or look ahead and see what we're really trying to accomplish here, take a break, change locations, something like that and get through it. Um, the first big problem I had is, uh, I think probably very common, uh, is somewhere about week 18, give or take. Yep, yep. And that's when you're, you know, stopping and you're getting the pup to fetch the dummy. Yeah. Just hold the dummy in his mouth. Now the dog puts everything in his mouth. He goes <laughs> and gets everything, a bowling ball. It doesn't matter. He's going to put it in his mouth. And so we're out here doing our work and he won't put a dummy in his mouth. And is he just the craziest thing (laughs) and i'm not the only one and it's just a it's just a funny quirk to this training and i don't fully understand it but i had had a bunch of trouble with that um and you know i i stopped on week 18 for a long time yeah it might have been 17 16 somewhere in there um but I can remember sitting and, you know, had the little plastic fence set up with the run in it. And, and we were about there yeah. and we were just stuck on the fetching, essentially. Fetch a dummy. You know, I think a lot of that, that's a hard place to be like, that's a hard spot. Like I get it. Cause like you, you've had so much success up to that point. Things have gone fairly well. And you're hoping that you're really, I think what makes that spot hard is if you look ahead at all, you realize I'm about to be using a launcher. I'm about to be doing a bunch of fun stuff. Which is what I really was looking forward to. Right. right. And then when you, but there's this one little section that goes right before it. And for people that are not using our program, um, other ways of training, hole conditioning or in uh, standard American style force Force fetch. fetch, And those programs take to, you know, quite a, it can take a while, four, yeah. six, eight weeks, mm-hmm. depending on the dog. So fortunately, typically, I would say the way we've done it, unless you hit a, a snag, it'll go a little bit faster than your standard routes of doing it. Well, but it, yeah, it, it, it's a very mentally challenging thing for the handler and the dog. Because mm-hmm. it really, I, I think, I don't know, this, up until that point, you can kind of skate by if that makes sense yeah you can yeah. you can get by and then maybe not realize it but when you get to this point there is no there's no as of getting by i mean you you it's going to test your muster a bit you really gotta well now that we're talking about it i'm remembering more yeah. um the memory's cranking a little slower than it used to but <laughs> i you know getting him to hold the bumper properly he would play with the bumper yeah but we, we don't, we're not trying to play with it we're trying yeah. to 
work with the bumper. So I've got a great picture of my son Clay when he was at the members weekend and it was like the dog and him. And I've got this close up shot of them both. He's holding the bumper in front of the dog's face and the dog's looking at him and they're just at this stalemate <laughs> and they, you know, it's nothing's happening, but they're going to yeah. just sit there until he, you know, try to get him to fetch it and for a hot dog. Yeah. You know? And we, we were going through that. Now I'm, I'm, this is all kind of coming back to me. So he would. I do remember that because I remember at member weekend we mm -hmm. did a little demonstration on fetch hold and release, and um, yeah, I remember us working a little bit yeah. after. And obviously, I was like, "Well, you're not going to solve it today." But I mean, he, we you can working, make a little bit of progress. We had the hot dog, and, and it was a bunch of people. You would sit sitting in chairs, holding a bumper in yep, front of I a remember pup, that. Yep. and the dogs looking at him like, "I don't know what you want me to do." Yeah. So, but you know, worked through it. He was uh, in in the end with this dog, and I don't know if this is this is just a quirky thing with him. We had some scrap lumber around, and he loved this piece of two by four that I noticed he would always get it in his mouth, and it was about the same size as a bumper. It was yeah. the same size as a bumper, and he would walk around with that in his mouth all That's the time. Awesome. And so, at some point, I just put the bumper away and did the started doing that week with this little two by four. That's awesome. And we'd had, we did that for about three days and then we put the bumper in and he, and that was it. We didn't that is back. crazy. Something as little as that, huh? That's amazing. Yeah. Um, what uh so you just started, I guess you're kind of sitting there thinking about it and just like, Hey, maybe he, maybe he'll like, maybe he'll like he, this. He was already putting that in his mouth and yep. carrying it around in, in the proper way. Like yep. he was fetching it right in the middle. Wow. You know, it, and, um, just the way you want to hold a, hold a bumper. So I just saw that happening and just substituted it. And it didn't take long at all. Yeah. And he was holding, and he would hold the bumper. That's fantastic. You know? yeah. And that's, that's what I love too, is thinking outside the box. I mean, and that's what we want for people to do. And that's mm -hmm. a great example. I love all the different ways I hear members yeah. thinking, and that's a really great way to think outside the box. You're taking, you're taking something that he's already doing good and then yeah. using it to your well, advantage. I think we polish that stuff up in our, in, in his, our, our personal history. You kind of polish it. Oh, I just gave him the two by four and two, three days later, boom, done. But I, in reality, I was probably frustrated for three weeks or something yeah. like that. It, it was a, it was a little bit of a thing. I've kind of forgotten that part. <laughs> it took a minute, it took a while. Yeah. So and, uh, how did it feel coming out of that? I mean, I guess it was you, amazing. You know, it was like you really can work. This you, know, you really this can really happen. Yeah, those doubts creep in. You're like, is my dog going to turn out? You know, is it going to be? That's easy. Like any time a problem arises, I mean, I feel like that's the first thing that's going to come up. At, you're, you start thinking, well, okay, you know, mm -hmm. and and some of that too is the level of standard you're training to too. Like, you know, some people. And that's what you can't really tell. Like you see people talking all about their dogs. Yeah, my dog did fine. I, you know, it did whole condition or whatever. And I was done in like three days. But there's also a standard mm -hmm. that we're shooting for. I mean, for us, we're going for pretty much perfect delivery. We want our dog to grab it in the right spot. Mm -hmm. We want our dog to come put it in our hands without us having to reach for it. We just want to hold out our hand and the dog puts it in our hand and then it's ready for the next retrieve. Right. That's a whole lot more work than a dog just grabbing something, coming in, either just dropping it at your feet or just dragging it by the tail the, or dragging it by the string of the bumper. Right. That's two different things. And right. um, so some of that, I would say, could be that that's a good thing that you were frustrated because you weren't settling for a lesser standard. Right. I think it's important, like a lot of this stuff, that you, you're building these skills one little increment at a time. And if you decide that, one of these little things is insignificant and you skip it, yep. it's going to speak later. <laughs> yeah. And so I learned very, very early on, I was like, I don't know why we're doing this, but I'm going to do it because, uh, you know, I, I, I think that I, I did that a little bit with whistle stop in the very beginning. Whistle sit. Yeah. <laughs> whistle sit in the very beginning. And I thought, well, I'm going to tell him to sit. I don't, I, I, just, I think I didn't even <laughs> realize that I was just, going to skip whistle sit. Well, that's yep. important because that's whistle stop. Yeah, absolutely. And then whistle stop is handling. And so um, that experience, you know, when I see that there's a detail that needs to be polished, it, there's a reason for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We pretty much, I think everything that's in there, there wasn't any filler. You yeah. Know, it, yeah. I mean, 
you got to think about it. We're filming for 56 weeks. So yeah, we didn't want to take any extra time to add any filler that didn't need to be there. If mm -hmm. it was relevant to creating an incredible retriever, we put it in there. If it wasn't, you know, we yeah. didn't do any like fancy tricks or anything. We focused on a incredible, consistent retriever, which is what we were hoping for. For sure. Yeah. So what, so going out of that moment, you, you face the challenge, you overcame the challenge. That's another thing we, I love about telling, allowing people to tell their stories and yeah. the, the opportunity of you coming on to share your story gets me excited is yeah. you get to, to share those triumphs. What, yeah. what, it, what was all that like as you're going and moving forward into launchers and everything else? Um, well, you know, it's important, I think to, you know, you have this little thing that you're trying to do that you're having trouble with and you work through it. Now you've passed that you're on to something else. Well, you, you know, it's like anything else and you go through through in life, you, you know, okay, well, I have that same feeling now I'm trying to get through this week and I'm having trouble. Well, we know we can get through this. I'm yeah. not sure how, but you know, we're going to, we're going to keep working on it make it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, the, um, he always did well with, 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 you know, marked retrieves launchers never gave him any problems he never you know i was easy i was worried he was going to have trouble with gunfire no problems there fortunately um another major problem i had as we moved into launchers and you know uh wingers yeah um whenever i have an opportunity to, to work with a winger uh he was completely unable to deal with a string on a on a dummy Oh, really? He would just lose his mind and just go into play mode. Oh yeah. He would yeah. Um, he would come to a dummy with a string on it. it. It could you know, and he would just grab that string and just start. He would lose his mind and start yeah. playing, and um, <laughs> he's spinning around in a circle with the tip of the string in his mouth. It was just ridiculous. Oh and, uh, man, that that so, had to get you going there. Yeah, and you know, I, I couldn't seem to do anything about it, and and um, you know, I checked in. Um, with you know, with the group, and I think Keith told me he's like, just cut that string off, just cut the string <laughs> off. And I thought, yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah, and that was the end of the problem for a while. And he's matured out of it. For, yeah. You know, every once in a while, I you know I had one dummy with a string, and I'd throw it, and he'd have some trouble with it for a while. But now he's past it; it's yeah. over. And he just kind of grew out of it. That's awesome. The one thing I want to hit on there too, I think a lot of people think that you know, maybe I'll just let it just keep happening and the problem will eventually go away. That's not really how it works. And that's what I love about how you handled that there. Like you didn't just like, maybe it'll go away. You're like, Hey, I've got to get help. I've got to figure this out because yeah. if you let it keep going, it, that actually is conditioning the dog to keep doing that. And it can make the problem significantly right. worse the longer you let it go. Acting, uh, you know, cutting up like that when it's work time. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, that's your, your hunting simulation. Yeah, that's right. And if you think about thinking about being on a hunt with, and your dog decides I'm going to go buck <laughs> wild, you know, and and he has not done that in the field. That's awesome. And I think you know it's. I think you want to step on that. Now he's he's a great all around dog. He is a, you know, a great pet. Also, my wife pampers him, and he's you know he he can do all that. But when it's work time, he I've really tried to keep him. He understands when this equipment is on, and we're dressed like this. Or any of these signs, he's he is, it's it's on. He's ready to work. Yeah, and, that's great. Uh, you know, it's, so yeah, it's interesting that you brought it up like that. And yeah, you know, I'm kind of dredging all this up as we're talking. Yeah. It's been a while since all that's happened. But yeah, because um, we did, yes. we kind of stopped. Just didn't didn't never really allow it. That's amazing. It was, it was tough. It wasn't. I didn't just tell him no and it stopped. It was a process. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, so that's that's yeah. huge. So you handled that well. That clearly has served you well. What um, you said, I believe y'all have hunted, correct? Y'all, yes. Okay, so he hunted last season. Let's talk about. Well, let's let's talk about that first season that you let him skip. I know that was tough. What thought process? How old was he? What all? What decisions went into that? Because I think a lot of people mess up there. They want to get their dog real world experience, and dogs do need real world experience, mm -hmm. but. If they're only if they're ready. You Let's know. see. We got him. I remember he was a small puppy in October. So he, you know, he was. Let me think about this. 
I think the first year it was obvious he shouldn't hunt. And I yeah. think the second year was when it was a possibility that he could hunt. We kept him back one yeah. more time. And I think that it would have, my thinking was that it was, um, it wasn't just going to be, you know, out there and limiting every time in 30 minutes with constant action. There was going to have to be a giant steadiness element to it. Right, right. And um, it's almost like with a kid, I don't, I don't like to, when my boys were small, I tried not to take them on any too, on too many terrible hunts. <laughs> I took them on plenty of terrible hunts, but it was never intentional. If I knew it was going to be bad and slow, I tried not to take them. If they got bored, we left, all that kind of stuff. And I think the same, you know, I wanted, I felt like he, he just wasn't ready to go through that. And yeah. I wanted him to, you know, be ready to be steady and ready to retrieve, but put him in a position to... I always think about what you say in the videos. You want to set them up for success, yeah. And you know, taking them on a hunt that might not have been that might have been too slow, or the retrieves were too challenging when we weren't we hadn't been through that work yet. Yeah. So I just did you know that so the first year when it was possible to hunt him, we weren't. I hadn't proved him out in the training. Yeah. And I wanted him to you know I wanted to wait until it was gonna gonna work well. And so this past season, which was you know uh, twenty two. Yeah, the hunting season of twenty two. He, um, you know, we were. He hunted in a, you know, we set up a mow marsh wherever we were hunting, and he, you know, loves that mow marsh. Does extremely well with it. Was incredibly steady. Um, and when we had ducks in front of him, he he was game. That's awesome. Pick him up, you know. So we're still working on some. We're still working on remote handling and that kind yeah. of thing. But he's. You know, but that you got yourself percentage of it, a dog yeah. getter. I mean, you got a dog that goes picks up your dog. Wants to do it. That's awesome. Really big time. Really, you know, fired up to do it. And I think you did a good job there too, because a lot of people that says the temptation is there. Yeah. I got, I've got me a duck dog. I need to take it out there. Well, yeah, yeah maybe. Mm. And you, that's an interesting case because most people, I say most. That may be an exaggeration. A lot of people will see if they can get by with things. Like, okay, I think my dog is kind of there. I like how you handle it. You're like, I, you just clearly weren't 100%, so you just didn't take him. And that's a good move. Too many variables, I yeah. thought, when he was at that level of experience. And as a matter of fact, God, I think I would have forgotten all this if we weren't doing this interview. <laughs> so what I, what I did at first for him, that first year, I took him uh, to a um, – was it Mallard Vale up in up south of Memphis, where it's a there's it's like a shooting preserve where they yeah. have basically semi wild mallards up there, and awesome. I took him up there and shot ten birds. Wow! And they're you know they they come flying in, and you can you can take them right in you know in a good spot for that's, the dog. That's awesome. And he got some retrieves the first day we got up there, and I'd been th it was time for him. You know I'd been doing some gun dog training and gotten into that portion of it got out there with this live shotgun and these birds flying around he lost his mind again because he's having a new experience <laughs> and um he was jumping in the water at the wrong time he would see the birds coming in he was breaking and just kind of just got too excited yeah and uh so this was the thing where we can't the guy was nice enough I, the night i got there we went and shot some birds that needed to be cleaned up yeah got that out of the way he would go out and he was ran out and was barking at a cripple it was just it was a mess wow, wow. the next morning we got out there and set up in a spot and he sat there steady and picked up ducks dang and it seems like he just needed to um you know, we repeated it. We did it in the in the evening, and then we went back the next morning and repeated the situation. Yeah. And it's like he he was just more calm, and you know, I just had to bring him along like you would a child. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, he had a too excited the first time, settled down the second time. That's perfect. So, and yeah. so things have gone, I guess, pretty well since then. Yeah. So then that happened at the end of, I guess. It was in 22, but it was at the end of the 21 duck season. Went up to the shooting preserve, shot some birds for him. Had a great time doing that. And then he hunted wild ducks in 22. Wow. And um, So he would have been – you got him in 2020, so he would have been around two Yeah. at that point? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got him in the fall of 20. Okay. So one, one, two. So he's two, yeah, two years old. So he, he kind of did the – 
kind of a practice hunt with wild duck, with you know semi wild ducks and yeah. on to sitting in a blind sit you know going out in in the cold and shooting woodies at first and gadwalls and stuff like that that's awesome what was your right. first wild the in the wild hunt like and i guess what was your let's talk about your 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 mindset going into it obviously you already had the the semi wild hunt yeah. so you kind of had some reference for what you were going to experience what right. how did that go um was I, I was alone on the semi wild hunt once i'm once i was on the wild duck hunt i I pretty much I would I brought either my kids or, or a friend out there and I would uh, sort of make shooting myself a secondary thing. Right. I would kind of put the shot, lean the shotgun, and I was going to work with the dog and yeah. kind of call and run the hunt. Uh, me me shooting became sort of it was, maybe it was a little too much for me. You know, yeah, I've got a <laughs> lanyard of calls and a dog whistle and the dog and the kids <laughs> and the guest and something's got to go. Yeah. So I, I, I had a great time. I mean, I, if I'm, if I'm putting other people on ducks and they're shooting, that's just fabulous. Oh yeah. I can't beat that. Um, but you know, I didn't, you know, he, uh, I think he was ready. I think holding him back was, was the right thing to do. Uh, getting him, getting enough training under his belt before he had to deal with a wild. Because you, know, you know, get out there and you're hunting wild ducks. Every it's very unpredictable, and they're coming from that's right where you didn't think they were going to come from, and they're falling in difficult places. All that, you know. Yeah. Um. But um, it you know I think he did really well. I think you know we we I, I probably had him to something like week forty yeah. before he went wild. Before I took him on a wild duck hunt. That's a good spot to be. I mean, at that point, I think you're, you got a really good dog on your hand. Yeah. 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 I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Colm is an incredible member and it's such an honor to have him on the podcast. You know, maybe you're on your training journey and you're just really not sure where to start or maybe you're having trouble along the way. And if that's the case, we would love to help guide you along the way. We have three different options for you ranging from $347 to $1,197, depending on which option you go with. So if you want to learn to train your hunting retriever step by step, then visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com, check out the different options options and get started today yeah so let's go ahead and, and kind of where you're going where you're at now with the the handling um that's really your, your next phase you run into a challenge there what um yeah let's let's talk about the challenge and, and see what we can work through yeah right so I, I think um the the next big stumbling block that i've come across and it, it it was concerning for a number of reasons, and I'm going to remember this one better because I'm in it right now. <laughs> it's not ancient history. Um, so he has been doing brilliantly with, you know, directional hand signals, and he always has a drive to go pick up the bumper and do whatever I want him to, you know, that, that stuff was solid. But what, what happened, what, you know, when we are now in a place where we want to set the dog up on a, a remote memory Mm -hmm. bring him back, send him on that, and st and then stop him with the whistle, have him look back, and then send him on another mark that he doesn't know about. Yeah. That's what I was working at. And he, uh, apparently, you know, what I'm seeing with him is if I send him, if he's on place and I send him after a bumper that he knows about, it's almost like, you know, now I'm giving him a, a signal that is – uh, contrary to what I've just told him to do, yeah, and he can, yeah. he just doesn't seem to grasp that at all. Yeah, he just does he blow on through, and then he just would keep he going? was blowing through the whistle and okay. going for that bumper. Yeah. So as I tried to work through that, I was doing all kinds of things to try to get him to stop in the middle of that track, so I could stop him, get him to look at me, and then I could send him where there's another bumper. Right, and as I I, I sort of tried to start to push him to do that he he started getting timid he started yeah. he was on place okay. i would send him and he wouldn't go with the first time in his life he was oh, just wow. he just wow. it was it was you know just he's just like i don't stuck. know what to do i don't know what to do stuck yeah. and then he's out there and he's like looking at me going are you gonna blow the whistle at an odd time i'm not sure what you're gonna <laughs> do and he started to get tentative instead of just exploding like he usually does and i thought okay i'm making a mistake here yeah and it wasn't just that I wasn't getting the lesson taught. It was that I was undoing past lessons. 
Oh yeah, that's bad. And so that's when I thought I need to. I would like to reach out and and get some guidance here because I thought I was going, uh, I was going backwards. I wasn't just stuck. I was going backwards. Yeah, spiraling out of control. Right, and so that's, and that's he's, you know that, that dog was just he the way he acted and up to then is I would blow the blow the comeback whistle, and he would just come straight. He yeah. always comes straight back, and he started to sort of be unsure about the whistle, no matter what I was doing with it. So I really felt like I needed to just back up and uh, get some input. That's awesome. So what yeah. you said you had tried a couple of things to like try to get him to stop, but it wasn't really working. What were some of the things you like tried? I was, uh, you know, I was getting the second place board and putting it out there yeah. and trying, trying to, blow, to the, blow the, st- I'd send him and I'd try to blow the, blow the stop whistle right at that place board. So he's yep. to give him maybe a visual that I'm supposed to stop here. Mm-hmm. And I really just was, I felt like I was making a mess. Yeah. It was, it was confusing him. And did you do any, how does he do on the, uh, when you sit him out midway, between the bumper and then you, or sit him towards the bumper, you recall him and you stop him on his way back without a bumper. Does he do pretty good on that? He, he can do that. Okay, so, he, so we're so good he, there. If I, if I call him and stop him, he's got that. Yeah. And I'll, you know, I spent a lot of time, I spent more than just a week going through that where I would, yeah. you know, because it takes time. When you get in that, you have to, it's, as all these lessons, you got you can't get out there and be in a hurry. You have to yeah. have plenty of time and do your time. So go, out there repeatedly and let him go all the way to the bumper just as many times as you stop him. Right. Like, listen to what you said on that very carefully. And so he would, you know, there was a time I remember him saying, you know, I'd stopped him some, you know, you stop, get him, send him back, uh, or, or call him to you and he'd be waiting. Are you going to, Yeah. you know, it was a kind of a, he was anticipating the whistle, but he could do that. But sending him out and trying to stop him when he's on the way to a bumper was, that's where the that's where it started yeah. for me. Any other things you tried uh, to work through, the, through that? Um, I tried to shorten the distance down. So okay. I was working with the place I was training. We had, you know, I was trying to put the bumper in some cover, and you know, I'm working. I'm working with 100, 125 yards, okay, maybe maybe 150 sometimes. And I was trying to bring that thing down to inside of 50 yards. Yeah, and um, that unfortunately just didn't. It didn't. Yeah magically fix it yeah and i think he was right. he was starting to get a little bit tentative about you know instead of you know i would send him and he was just tentative about going yeah. at this point and i felt like i just needed to stop yeah. for a minute um that's that's that can happen i've got some yeah. ideas and some things we could work through mm-hmm. now there's a couple of ways i typically would work through something like that um <laughs> sometimes i'll work through it backwards if that makes sense so on one hand, it's good to drill down and try to focus on that one problem. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we drill down and focus on the one problem too much, it just causes a host of other problems. So sometimes you have to go, really what I'm saying is position from a different angle, which Mm -hmm. we might want to consider trying. Or we may want to just try a couple of things like put the bumper further away, but have the dog stop at like 10 yards. You send them, stop them. At ten yards, or going back to the vocal command, sit, then adding the whistle in, and there's just a few different things we can try instead of because obviously, I mean, there's nothing wrong with what you tried; it just didn't work. Yeah, so, yeah, and it may have worked for an, another dog, but right. for this dog, it's not working. So, what do we do? We just got to keep positioning different things, different angles, until we get something that works like we want it to. Um, if that doesn't work, my next. You know, I would try probably that initially just to see if we could do it quick. If that doesn't work, then I would go from a completely different angle and I would build confidence on driving out. I know this sounds counterintuitive, but I would do even more getting them to drive out and go pick stuff up, drive out, pick stuff up. Mm-hmm. But then I would also simultaneously work on simple whistle stop away from that area and mm-hmm. like fun stuff. Like as soon as he stops, throwing a tennis ball or a bumper and rewarding him for, for stopping when stopping, he's excited. Yeah. So yeah, there's, we can do a couple of things like that mm-hmm. and just kind of play with it until we figure yeah. him yeah. exactly and, and, out. You know, remember, like in, in an earlier part of this conversation, I was talking about in the very, that first 10 weeks, yeah. I sort of almost without noticing it, had kind of blown off whistle set. Yes. And I so had you to think go that's back and clean back up. To bite you a little I bit. think this is okay. part of this. Yeah, I really do. I think it can get cleaned up. It can definitely get cleaned up. So cleaned much up. other stuff, but I think it's just that 
whist- ignoring whistle set for a few weeks made whistle stop a little harder. And now this, yeah. now we're kind of doing this. So it's, it's, um, I think that that may be the genesis of it. Well, it could be, yeah. but that's okay. Maybe that's yeah. uh, more than likely it is. I mean, if if yeah. you if you skip anything, it can come back to bite you. But um, that doesn't mean you can't conquer it later. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. I he, think we can. I think we can get you through that for sure. I think so. No problem. Well, what uh, kind of as we close this out, we kind of talked about that. Which you know, once we finish this podcast, we got to yeah. get out there and do some training and come back. S- and say how it goes. Yeah, maybe. we, we yeah. might as well. I mean, yeah. I, I think we should. We can talk about that, get a little bit of footage, and and share it with everybody That'd so they great. can see what's going. But all right, guys. So interrupting the podcast, and I always said that we'd get out here and train and maybe get you some footage. So that's what we're doing uh, yesterday. Colum and I we came out here and trained with Bo, and uh, we had a good time and really worked on just getting that whistle stop down like we talked about if you remember from from the episode um or if you're not there in the episode yet you'll see here in a bit we were he was struggling with that at this time so uh we're going to show you kind of what we've been working on right now we're starting off with a couple of just super long lining memories to get the edge off in the morning the dogs first woke up this morning it's all excited so we want to get him and his dog on the same page so that's what they're doing right now we're going to let them run those uh retrieves real quick then we'll get get over here and work on some whistle stop and we'll kind of i'll go over as we continue on here i'll go over the details that really uh started working what was so funny is we got out here and asked if i could work his dog for him and uh i did and it worked perfectly so i was like man you've done a great job training this dog he's like i can't believe it's doing that i was like well let's go over the details so i watched him how he was doing it and then we kind of went over a few details that were on point that made a big difference so we'll show those to you here in just a minute but uh for now let's check out these retrieves all right repeat that yeah so let's um let's stop right there that's perfect and we'll come right here okay. then this time we're going to recall him to you we're going to stop him halfway back we want to start with a win with stopping him instead of on the way out since you just did the bumpers out then this next retrieve the second retrieve we will send him from here and stop him on okay, his so way. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop him and give him a back, bring the first bumper. That's correct. Gotcha. Yeah, stop him. Yeah, stop him between halfway between where you're at now and where he is. Okay. And then give him a back. Here. Sit. Back. Perfect. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right. Okay, let's see what he can do here on, on this one. Let's try to get him a good whistle, a whistle stop. But actually, just do the vocal command sit for this time. All right. Just stop him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Give him, there you go. Sit. Ah, look at that. Good. Back. Excellent. Now I want good. you to go quickly and do it again. All right, come on. Careful. When you get a good rep, you always want to go back and quickly do it again. Boom. Back. Sit. Good. Back. Nice. All right. I love that. So he needs that. He needs now he's listening bit, he to it. He needs, he needs to be commanded. Yes, yeah. sir. We're not asking him to go back. We're telling him, hey, you're yeah. going back. Yeah, good. Good. All right, do it again. Do it again. Yes, Heel. sir. Heel. Back. There you go. Sit. Nice. Back. Incredible. What I really want to point out, too, is his delivery right here. I know we talked about this is one of your greatest struggles, but look at this delivery. This is... Yeah. Dude. Had it been worth all that work you put into it. Yeah. Kind of as we, as we close out um, this episode, what... What what are you most excited about moving forward? Just kind of sounds like you got a pretty solid gun dog in her hands already, and you know, I mean, that's awesome. Now that you've yeah. done this, you've invested two two and a half years. Yeah. You got some things that a little tweaking here and there, and mm-hmm. you've got not just a great gun dog, but you've got an incredible retriever. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty awesome for yeah, we're a close. I mean, investment. I really think this is so uh, pivotal. I feel like this is. Uh, you know, everything, all of this is important. Whistle sit was important, come to find out. <laughs> but, you know, this this right here, it's like he's teetering on like the 
the edge of just sliding down to a finished gun dog. Yeah. If I can, you know, if, if, if I can get him to what he's doing is he he's on the verge of learning when I'm giving whistle commands and, and hand signals that he needs to be very interested in that because he's, I'm showing him where the duck is. Right. We're showing him where the bumper is or whatever, where it is we're picking up. And that's going to be, you know, in, in the field, that's constant. It happens all the time, yeah. every time almost. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, as I, I was, you know, I hit a bad snag and was starting to make him tentative on things he'd never been tentative about. It's a very important moment. Yeah. I really think this is like the cr- critical moment to his uh, maturing and being finished. Yeah. Right here. I think we can, I think we can knock that out. And I think, um, like I said, I, you know, if we try one thing and it doesn't work, then based on what you're saying, typically that that's the game we play, right? You know, your dog's doing good, but if they, if you start to see their personality reel back in and not be what it normally is, that is typically a sign for me. Like, Hey, let's change the, I, I call it flipping the tables. Yeah. Let's flip the tables on them, change everything. And then change their whole routine, yeah. get them into a new situation so yeah. that they're Yeah, and I think still. that, you know, now that you're mentioning that, I think he was, you know, the the place we were in a rut of, you know, we were in a pattern of training in this one in this one spot. And I could see him being, he, I think he's a little bored yeah. too. So I think um, it's a good, it's a good time to switch it up on it yeah. and get him somewhere new. So perfect. Yeah. Well, um, typically how we close this out and I always like to ask this question if you could give yourself some advice um, before you got started what would that be if you could knowing what you know now what would you tell yourself three years ago when you were looking at getting a dog and getting started training it yourself um, well I mean I, I, I don't I wouldn't do uh, too much different I mean I, I awesome. think that, that you know getting involved in CGA right off the bat was, was critical for me because I, I just, I need that structure. Yeah. If I have to, you know, create my own lesson plan, I just, I, I was not going to happen. I was not going to be able to get it done. You have, um, uh, in the best of circumstances, you have a windows of opportunity to go train. We have other th- things going on, yeah. unfortunately. And, um, you know, you have to be efficient. You have to know what you're about to go do. You have to have a plan. And you know, that this, the 52 week plus just, you know, is structure enough for me. It, it allows me to get it done. Now I would do that. If I, now what I would do differently, I would probably, you know, go forward and, and get all that gear together right off the bat, <laughs> yeah. everything that you're going to need, get it, just get it and have it there. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, busy people. I think that you have to, you have to plan your session and you cannot get out of your truck and get the dog out feeling rushed. Yeah. That's a good, you, you one. really, you've got to be settled down. You've got to understand this is how much time I'm going to spend and I'm not going to rush through this. Yeah. I'm not going to try to get this done quick so I can go to another thing. You, you, you because the, you know, the dogs pick up on your, um, that vibe. Yeah. If you're feeling, if you're, if you get out there and you're nervous and you feel I've, I've got less time than I normally do today, you might yeah, want to train another day. day. Yeah. That's a good, it's just, that's it, really it, good. You're, you're about to not have a good training session. <laughs> At least countless times. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Yeah. I've done it myself, you know, trying to rush through or on, on, on top of that too, is like trying to like, okay, I'm going to accomplish all of this in today's session. Oh, you, know, yeah. you come with your agenda Sometimes that agenda gets wrecked. No, you have to be, be willing to walk that 200 yards out there with that bumper. Yeah. Now we're going to do this. We're going to heal and walk out there again because we need to, you know, do it in different ways. And this takes time. So you have to plan. You have to know that you're going to do that. Yeah. And, you know, you know, keep that nervous energy down. Don't be in a rush. That's the main thing. I've, I've, I've done it a lot and I just know it. That's solid. Doesn't uh, doesn't make good a good training session if you're rushing. Yeah. So. Well, that's really good advice. Yeah. I'm glad glad you shared it. I think there's some really good things that people could learn from your experience that you've shared here on, on this episode. And uh, really, it's been an honor to have you. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on and talking through some of your challenges, yeah. some of your 
uh, successes. And uh, I really look forward to seeing how the rest of the journey goes for you. And uh, looking forward to getting out there in the field Absolutely. here in a bit. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Yes, sir. Well, Love thank it. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Build From Here podcast. To learn more about retriever training or our podcast, visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com slash podcast.